Thank you for tuning in to Manifesting Sons broadcast. Today we would like to share with you an impactful message by Dr. Mark T. Jones Sr., building a life that glorifies God. We hope you enjoy our program. Second Timothy 4, let me share something with you. When, when you look at the Word of God, if, if you see this as rules, you ain't right. If you see the word of God and the commandment as rules, you ain't right. Your mind's not right about it. Because somebody shout, there is protection. Y'all ain't gonna say it? Say, say there is protection in the principle. Everything God commands and directs, oh my God. All right, I'm going there. Everything God commanded and directed concerning your life. Somebody shout the word of God. There is protection in the principle. Now, here's what you got to trust. God is protecting you from things through principle that you don't even know you need protection from. Y'all hear me? And most of the time you won't know until you end up needing deliverance. Hello? Come on, tell somebody, if you can't accept protection, you're going to need deliverance. But where is the protection? It's in the principle. Oh, are y'all hearing me? There are some things God told you knowing you. That's why he says to him that knows it to be sin, for him it is sin. Y'all know that that even though the destination, God's working to bring us all into his presence, but God knows he can't get all of us there the same way. Tell somebody what it take for you to break, it take a little bit more for me. Y'all scared to tell your neighbor that. What it take for you to break, it take a little bit more for me because I'm hard-headed. <laughs> but, but now watch this now. Say it with me. God love hard-headed people. Now, now ask me why. Because he know once you get it, you ain't going to move from it. No better praise what a hard head folk in the house. He know, that one, he know that when you get it for real, you ain't going to change. All right. I'm going to the scripture, but I'm going to give an example. Listen to what God called the Israelites. A stiff-necked people. If that ain't hard-headed, I don't know what hard-headed is. He said, all day long, I've stretched out my arm to a stubborn, rebellious, and stiff-necked people. Now, here's the thing you ought to think about right now. Why did heaven's most trusted commodity land in the, pres land in the possession of hard-headed, stiff-necked, rebellious people? You know why? Because he knew Stiff-necked people ain't going to change. So he gave them something he didn't want changed. So tell somebody, your stubbornness is not a problem to God. He's going to break you. Come on, tell somebody, he's going to break you, and then he's going to use it. Because there's something he wants to not be altered that he wants to do on the earth. So he put it, he put it in, in, the, in the mind of somebody with a strong mind. Y'all right understand that? Which means that, watch this now. You're, tell somebody, you hard-headed by design. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. All right, all right. Now, now ask me how I know this. Y'all see how unmoved I am about this vision no matter what happened? That, that right? Y'all see how un, un, I am absolutely unbotherable about all this? No matter what people do, what they don't do, who come, who go. Y'all see why I'm unbothered? I started out very stubborn. <laughs> oh, hello, somebody. Hello. But when God wants to get something done, he puts it in a person of resolve. Stubborn people are resolved even if they're wrong. <laughs> are y'all going to 
going to let me preach my message today. So, t- so, so watch it now. So God going to get you right. Tell somebody, God going to get you right and then use that. Because he wants to, watch this now. He wants to, he wants to do something through the lives of people that are not a flight risk to the kingdom. Oh, y'all did not hear what I just said. I said God wants to use some people that won't wimp out the moment warfare come against their soul. God wanted people that will remain steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding. And I'm telling you, that's why God chose some hard-haired folk to do what he wants to get done. <laughs> Pretty smart, ain't it? Tell somebody, God's smarter than you. <laughs> isn't that something? It's pretty smart. God knows all men, and he uses all things for his purpose. The fight, the faith, and the finish. So our final lesson is going to come from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Building a life that glorifies God. Today we're going to talk about the fight, the faith, and the finish. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Watch what Paul says. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not, and not to me only, but to all them. Somebody shout, that includes me. But to all them that love his appearance. So let's start out today talking about the fight. If you're going to build a life that glorifies God, you're going to have to learn how to fight. If you're going to build a life that glorifies God, you're going to have to not not only accept that resistance is a confirmation to your improvements. You writing that down? I'll wait to Shana. Hold on, y'all. We got to wait to Shana write that down. Say resistance is a confirmation to my improvements. Not only must I accept that resistance is a confirmation to my improvement, but there are ordained battles. Oh, my God. There, there are battles that the circumstances of my life have given me, and I've got to learn how to fight. See, I've got to learn how to fight. One of the first things Paul said here in the culmination of his life, which is Timothy here is talking about the culmination of a life lived for the glory of God. He said, I have fought a good fight. Watch what he said. He said, there are a lot of things that came against me as I endeavored to live the life that God is glorified through. But I didn't wimp out. I didn't go back to being like I was. I didn't didn't give up on the press because of the pressure. I didn't give up on my journey because of the falsehood that went on even in the house of God. Watch what he said. Somebody said, I learned how to fight. Because, watch this now, because there are certain battles. Every one of you sitting under the sound of my voice, tell somebody there's a battle with your name on it. Listen, look at two people and tell them, there's a battle with your name on it. Tell somebody else, there's a battle with your name on it. Somebody shout, there's a battle with my name on it. One of the first things that you got to battle in order to live a life that glorifies God is that you have to battle to break free of the dysfunctional system that raised you. I am talking about your mama and them in church. I said you have the battle to break free of the mindsets of the delivery system that brought you to the planet. The greatest war that you'll ever fight in life is to overcome the narrative that has been encrypted into your mindset through the flawed philosophies of those who God used to bring you to the planet. Now tell somebody who brought you to the planet may not necessarily bring you to the kingdom. Hello somebody, you better learn how to manage your expectations of them. I can't even believe my own mama. You better learn how to manage your expectations of them because who brought you to the planet may not necessarily bring you to the kingdom. So the first fight that you got to learn how to fight. Say, I'm fighting family dysfunctions. 
Now, the problem with most of us, you think you're normal because you've been by yourself. Oh, help me. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Everybody think they're all right when they're by themselves. Look at somebody ask them, how you doing with others? You don't really know where you are until you have to deal with others. Look at somebody tell them, my deliverance are with others. I really don't know what's going on inside of me by myself. I, I don't know what's going on inside of me all by myself. It's not until I have to deal with you that I realize that my, 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 my family dysfunctions are living on the inside of me and they want to get with you. So one of the first fights you got to learn how to fight. Somebody said, I got to fight through this dysfunction. One is, here's the second thing you got to learn how to fight in the fight, in the, in the process of building a life that glorified God. You have got to fight the spirit of perversion. What if, what if I told you that there are some things you can't get delivered from until you stop calling them your personality? There are some things you cannot get rid of as long as you're still calling it my personality. That's just the way I am. No, this is the way you cope because you don't know how to be you. This is the way you cope because somebody abused you for being you. So you can you contort it into something God cannot use. And anytime you take a perfectly good life and now you're using it for something other than what God intended, somebody shout that's perversion. And as some of you right now, it's not that you're out living wickedly. You're not living wickedly. You're not, you're just not living intentionally. It's still perversion. It's still perversion. Say it with me. If I'm not in God's will, as preordained, I am in perversion. Perversion is the obstruction of intent. Perversion is the obstruction of intent. What are you doing with your life that God never intended? Perversion is the obstruction of intent. Why, who are you letting keep you from what God said to you because they don't believe a woman should do it? Perversion is the obstruction of intent. So you got to say, I got to battle through this perversion. Because there's somebody right now, God uses you in a very strange way. Strange is not weird. Hello, somebody. Strange. Somebody shout, I'm strange by design. Some of you right now, the reason that you haven't moved intentionally is because you've never found anything like you. The very thing that will make you prosper is the very thing that got you bottled up. Y'all realize how awkward it was building manifestation worldwide? Y'all realize how strange it was when God gave me the name of a church, the Center for Manifestation? Y'all realize how awkward it was to hear some things that I had never heard or seen on the planet before? Let me share something with you so you can stop blaming church people for this. Nobody can teach you to be the you God designed you to be. But God. The church can teach you structure. The church can teach you order. The church can teach you holiness. The church can teach you how to, how to uh, uh, accept accountability. Submission can destroy your pride. But the church will never be able to teach you the lessons that will make you uniquely you. You understand that? So perversion, watch this now, is the obstruction of intention. If you're going to build a life that glorifies God, tells me you got to come out of perversion. Now, there's some of you right now that you're more committed to what people think about you. <laughs> I don't want them to think, how did that get to trump God's will for your life? How did that win a place of superiority over the will of God as revealed to you. Just my God hasn't changed his mind. Now watch this now. So God has not, the Bible said the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God is not going to turn back on what he said concerning your life because you turn from what he said concerning your life. Perversion is the obstruction of intention. Somebody said, I got to battle through that. Now thirdly, you got to battle your way through distortion. 
And distortion is when you are doing the right thing the wrong way because you have been listening to the wrong ones about how to do it. Y'all did not hear what I just said to you right now. Tell somebody, God don't want you being a copy of your favorite Christian heroes. Come on, tell somebody, God don't want you being a copy of your favorite Christian heroes. So you're being intentional, but you are distorted. Meaning, meaning, you haven't found the courage to be authentically you. So you become a copy of others to, be, to make them comfortable with you. Y'all did not hear what I said. You become a copy of others to make them comfortable with you. I said you become a copy of others to make them comfortable with you. Somebody shout, that's distortion. Now, y'all know in order to get distortion, distort, in order to get distortion, y'all, anybody remember when the TVs had them, them antennas on them? And somebody, somebody shout, in order to get distortion out, I got to improve my angle. Oh, oh, here it is. That's the angle that gets distortion out. Audience of one. I say, here's the angle that gets, look, remember the TV? This is the, this is the angle. Oh, this is the angle that gets distortions out. Y'all understand that? You know, I, I never forget when I first started Manifestation Worldwide. And I went through this shedding season, Keon, because I, I looked at, our, at, at the ministry that was forming. And you know what I said? I said, wait a minute. I said, this ain't me. This is who raised me. So I had to shed my, watch this now. God used spiritual leadership to bring me to a certain point in my life. Then I had to shed, listen, I had to shed what was with me that was them. So that I could be courageous enough to be me. Now write this down. You are not courageous enough to be yourself as long as you're still moved by criticism. Tells my criticism don't faze me. Now, now watch this now. So you got to get your soul to a place where criticism don't phase you because being you is going to come with a lot of negative sentiments. My God, being yourself is going to come with a special brand of antagonism. Now, here's the good news. Everybody who antagonized me didn't last, and I did. <laughs> tell somebody, if you just hold on, if you tell somebody, if you just hold on to being you, everything coming against you is going to fade away. Somebody shout, I'm going to outlast it. Man, I look back over the years of the loud mouse, and I'm like, none of them lasted. You understand that? Why? Because God never ordained you to be against me. Come on. Your ego ordained you to be against me. You understand that? You know, you got to have some kind of distraction in your life when you feel obligated to just wake up and be against people. <laughs> Y'all, anybody know people like that? That every day they wake up, they got to find somebody to be against? Tell somebody, that is not a meaningful purpose in life. So the first thing I got to do if I'm going to build a life that glorifies God, somebody shout, I've got to learn how to fight. Look at somebody tell them, all my life I had to, uh, never mind, go ahead. Never mind. The next thing that we've got to embody if we're going to live a life that glorifies God, you have got to learn, watch this now, you have got to learn how to walk in the faith. Somebody shout fight and faith. Now, faith only means that pleasing God is to believe his definition of things. Listen, here's this, uh, let me give you faith in a nutshell, all right? Faith is simply me. Anybody, anybody ever go, do you know a word? I know now they don't go to dictionaries no more. They do what? Google it, right? So faith is accepting God as your Google. When I don't understand what something means, somebody shout, I, I, I goggle. I, I, I goggle. I'm only, watch this now. 
I'm, on, my, I'm only going to accept God's definition of what this season means in my life. I'm going to only accept God's definition of these strange things that are going on. I'm only going to accept God's definition for this next step that I've got to take. It doesn't have, tell somebody, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It's got to make faith in me. My movements don't have, come on, tell somebody, my movements don't have to make sense to you. They have to make faith in me. I finished my course. Watch what he said. I kept the faith. I, I, I kept, I, I never stopped believing that what God said he, he was able to perform. I never stopped believing that things were exactly as God defined them no matter what came against me. I never stopped taking God at his word. Even when he was allowing things in my life that seemed to be an absolute contradiction to his word. If you're going to live a life that glorifies God, you're going to have to learn how to walk by faith. We look not at the what, but the things which are what? So in order to glorify God, the first thing we've got to become refined in, write this down, I've got to become refined in the walk of faith. Meaning that I've got to learn how to navigate this life in his word with God defining everything. I want y'all to think about something that we like to make religious, right? The Bible says walk in the spirit, right? Walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Isn't that right? Now think about this. Walk in the spirit for, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So walking in the spirit is simply walking in what the word said. Tell somebody, do what God said. Now, 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 if you're going to live, if you're going to build a life that glorifies God, you're going to have to put your feelings way down on the list of what you refer to when making decisions. Oh, y'all are not ready for this one. Y'all are not ready for this one. Tell somebody, quit making decisions with your feelings. That's how you keep getting in trouble. There's a way that seems right. You know why it seems right? Because it feels right. Quit making decisions with your feelings. How do I build a life that glorifies God? Know what God said and do it without having to feel anything. Y'all hear me? Know what God said and start moving before, listen, start moving before your feelings talk you out of your faith move. You understand that, believers? If you're going to live a life that glorifies God, you've got to put your feelings way down at the bottom of the list in terms of what you refer to. You've got to refer to what did God say? What say? What did God say? Now watch this now. My job, this is what I posted this morning. Say I'm a believer. My full-time job is to believe God. That's my job. I say I'm a believer. My full-time occupation is to believe God. Now, you know what? If you'll work at believing God, believing God will yield dividends in your life that you could have never experienced had you not come into this process and this pattern and perfected this pattern of simply hearing what God said and do what God said no matter what you feel. Now, all right, this will save your marriage. <laughs> Hello, somebody. This will change your life. You understand that, believers? This will change how you interface with other people. What did God say? Not, I'm not concerned about how you're looking at me and what you feel. What did God say I am supposed to be in your life? You understand that, believers? That makes sense to you? Do y'all realize that as a spiritual leader, I constantly have to work through people's suspicions of me just to lead them? You think I can't see it in their eyes? They expect me to be more of the same of what hurt them. You think I can't see that? But now watch this now. I'm more concerned about what I'm supposed to be to you than what I see you looking at me with. Somebody shout, I'm the influencer. Somebody shout, I'm the influencer. Now watch this now. Somebody shout, I'm the agent God put on the scene. 
And that's how you ought to go into any arena that you go into. Somebody say, I'm God's man. I'm God's woman in the scene. So it doesn't matter what's going on around me. What matters is the greater one lives on the inside of me. And I am here to, to effectuate change. This environment ain't going to change me. It will be changed through me. So the walk of faith means we got to learn how to navigate this life using the word of God. All right? You know, for example, there, there are some of you right now, and then we're going to talk about the second aspect, and that is the victory of faith. Believing until you see what God promised. But there are some of you right now, watch this now, that you deal with a lot of things, and the moment things don't go the way you thought they should, you give up. You give up. You cave in. You cater to, you don't toe the line, and faith does not benefit you unless you walk all the way through the process of faith. Now, that brings me to the next uh, aspect of what it means to refine this walk of faith. And that is, watch this now. We've got to learn, we've got to learn how to walk into the victory of faith. Write that down, the victory of faith. So the first is the walk of faith where I'm navigating this life by the word of God. I'm doing, say it with me, I'm doing what the word said. Now listen, I'm doing what the word says. Principle is gonna what? Principle is going to protect me. Somebody shout, there's protection in the principle. I don't care what people around me are doing. It's not my job to manage what everybody else is doing. I, I don't mind that I don't fit into what y'all doing. I don't mind that I don't fit into what y'all doing. Now watch this now. I am more concerned, I'm more concerned about acting on what God showed me than I am fitting into the status quo. <laughs> now, the next aspect of faith is this, the victory of faith. You've got to learn how to hold on to what God said until you see it come to fruition. Now, watch this now. The most dangerous, oh, God help me. The most dangerous thing that a believer could ever have in their possession. It's not a 370, it's not a 357. It's not a 45. It's not a nine millimeter. The most dangerous thing, it's not a bazooka. It's not a tank. The most dangerous thing, oh, that a believer could ever have in your possession is experience with God. Oh, God. Tell somebody, I'm dangerous when I've seen God come through. I'm dangerous when I have, been, when I have had situations come up in my life and I didn't have nothing to hope in, yet God gave me a word. I held on to that word, and God defied all the odds. God overthrew everything that was standing in my way, and God manifested what he said. Somebody said, I've got experience with God. Oh, so I know how to hold on to the victory of faith. <laughs> Tells me I'm dangerous because I got experience with God. Watch this now. Watch this now. I have seen him work it out. I have seen, anybody seen him come through? Anybody seen him overturn the whole system to make sure that the word he gave you come to pass? Hey, 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 anybody seen God undo something that looked unmovable just to manifest what he said in your life? Oh, God, it's dangerous to have experience with God. It's dangerous to the demonic realm when you have experience with God. And then when they start threatening you, uh, come here, come here, Tiffany. There, listen. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. There are some unnecessary adversaries coming against you. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare over your life that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And really just jealous of your results. They're really just jealous of your results. But I cancel the assignment of the enemy. 
I bind the hand of the wicked one that's trying to distract. I rebuke the devourer in Jesus' name. And not only shall you increase more and more, but your influence is increasing also. And you're just like Daniel. Your influence is about to increase. And there are people speaking against you because they don't want to see you in that place. But the Lord has established it. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And you will enter in. And you'll see the fullness of what God promised concerning your life. In Jesus' name. Somebody give the Lord praise for the victory. Give him praise for the victory. Somebody shout, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. And Tiffany, you will outlast them. Y'all know what's going to happen? She going to watch them cleaning out their desks. you with some kind of nonsense but I'm telling you you are built to last touch the people and tell me you are built to last you are built to last you are built to last no weapon form shall prosper against you the Lord is your rock and your defense now I hear the Lord saying just stay in grace listen Stay in grace. Don't speak a word against them. And when the dust settle, you will still be standing. All right, y'all sit down. Let me finish this. Now, now, listen to me. There's somebody going to try to bait you into a conversation you don't need to be in. Y'all better hear what I'm telling you. I'm not just talking to her. I'm talking to somebody. Somebody's going to try to bait you into a conversation you shouldn't be in. Stay out of that. You're not there for all that. I know what I see. I know what I see. see. Well-meaning people. You hear about this? No. No. Don't, don't take, tell somebody, don't take the bait. Because they bait you in to claim that you are co-conspirator. All right. Third thing you got to developing this faith walk, write this down, the endurance of faith, the endurance of faith. So you got to get developed to a place. How many want to glorify God with your life? You got to get developed to a place where you still have faith after the contradiction. You still have faith after the setback. You still have faith after the trial. You still have faith when the prophecy seemed to not be right. You still believe God. Now, the third aspect of building a life that glorifies God is your finish. Watch this now. Write this down. There's a journey that you have started with God that you must finish. I have finished my course. Somebody shout, my course. Very fact that Paul said, I finished my course, means that there's a very specialized process that God has ordained for each one of our lives. And tell somebody, you have got to go through it. Tell somebody it's too high to get over. Tell somebody it's too low to get under. Tell somebody you stuck in the middle. <laughs> you've got, come on, tell somebody you've got to go through it. You can divorce yourself from it. You can step yourself down from it. You have got to go through it. You can't keep running from it. Tell somebody you have got to go through it. Listen, you would think with all that Paul was going through that God had bumped his head. Paul was shipwrecked. He was beat with rod. He was betrayed by countrymen. He was betrayed by church folk. And it was exactly the perfect will of God for his life. Tell somebody you are stuck in the middle of it and you've got to go through it. You will not be able to stand here in the hall of faith and say, I did exactly what God wants if you keep running from what God ordained. That I finished my course. My course? You mean to tell me being shipwrecked, swimming ashore, and then get bit by a venomous snake was part of the course? He said, Yeah, I was trying to teach you that no weapon formed against you would prosper. 
I was trying to teach you that what keeps you safe is not a ship, but that you are in the smack dab in the middle of my wheel. Y'all hear what I said? He said, I was trying to teach you that even if something venomous come and bite you, it can't kill you because of the word. The word that's living on the inside of you will keep you alive longer than the snake. The snakes that bit you will die before you do. Shake it off. Tell somebody, the snakes that bit you won't survive, but you will. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Tell somebody else, the snakes that bit you won't survive, but you will. They're going into the fire of God's presence in your life, and they're not coming out, but you're coming out like go. You're coming out with a testimony that what should have killed me didn't have a chance to do so. You're coming out with a testimony that the devil tried me, but I survived. Anybody got a testimony? The devil tried me, but I survived. And not only did I survive, I thrived through this whole thing. I've got to another dimension in God because of snake bites. Touch two people and tell them you survive, you survive, you survive, you survive. Not only did you survive, but honey, you better. Not only did you survive, you're wiser. Not only did you survive, but you got grace on your life. Not only do you survive, but you're prospering. Not only did you survive, but you know God better now than you did before the snake bite. How you finish? Tell somebody how you finish matters. There's a journey. Oh, man. There's a journey. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Woo. Tell somebody, don't you dare turn around. 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 Don't you dare go back to where you came from. Don't you dare lay down. Don't you dare quit. You must survive. You got to go through this. It's, it's part of your process of becoming what God promised. You must go through this. This is how God will develop your resolve. Hello. This is how God will develop your resolve. Hallelujah. Look at somebody tell me, I feel much braver than I used to. I feel much braver. Anybody else feel brave these days? I, I feel much braver than that weaker version of me. All right. You got to finish this. Tell somebody, you got to finish this. Now, here's what finishing is all about. Number one, finishing is about surrender. Write this down. Surrender is the journey to the end of yourself. Surrender is the journey to the end of yourself. Paul said, I did more than all, yet not I but Christ who was in me. Surrender is the journey to the end of yourself. It's learning to trust God. Somebody shout, my times and my seasons are in his hands. Now, I'm gonna tell you one of the ways you can get to a place. There's some of you right now that have a hard time making decisions because you don't believe your times and your seasons are in his hands. The steps of a good man are what? So here's what I've learned to do. Say it with me, I've surrendered to God so I just take the step. I don't belong to me anymore. I don't have anything else to do with my life. I ain't got no agenda. I say I have surrendered. So I just take the step. Because the steps of a good man. Oh, somebody shout, when I decide, it's what God decided. So I'm going to go ahead and decide. Now, there's no room for confusion in your journey with God. Hello? Don't be letting somebody else write chapters of your life. God's not the author of confusion. There's no confusion in the process of walking with God. Well, I don't know what I should do because you're listening to too many people. You understand that? See, my life, say with me, my life is over. So watch this now. So... So because I'm his, I, I'm bought with a price. My life is over. I have no agenda. I gave up what I had planned. I'm going to just go ahead and take the step. Which one? 
the one that came to my heart. The hard one that God has to move if it's God. No, no, no. I'm not taking the easy step because that's the God not included process. I'm going to take the step. I'm going to take the step that it has to be God because there's no way I can complete this on my own. I said, y'all hear what I said? I'm gonna do somebody said, I'm doing the hard thing. I'm gonna do the kind of stuff that God has to show up or I'm going down. Y'all hear what I said. <laughs> I'm gonna do the stuff that if God don't come through, I'm gonna look like a fool. <laughs> I'm gonna do the stuff that if God doesn't move on my behalf, I'm going to be the laughing stock of Tampa, Florida. But now here's the, here's the thing I want, to remember, I want to remind you. I've got history with God. I've got, hello, somebody. Somebody said, I got history with God. Somebody said, I got history with God. And I don't know about you, but I have seen God come through. I remember the God that came through on the last day, at the last hour, but he still came through. So I've got a history with God. I've got the kind of history with God that I know. Somebody said, when I step, he's going to step because he is the one that ordained my steps. So just take the step. Just now, now let me caution you. If you have any need to please people, you should be concerned about every little step you take. But if you know in your heart, any, listen, don't play with this. Anybody in your heart, all you want to do is please God? Just take the step. Then take the step. Because the very fact that you only want to please God means that your steps are ordained of God. Y'all understand as believers? And it ain't God if it ain't dangerous. You realize how difficult it is to love the unlovable? You need God to do that. You understand that? You know how, how, how difficult it is to, to, pers to persevere in relationship because of an assignment when you're dealing with someone and yo you got a good memory you just don't have unforgiveness it's dangerous unless God is involved finishing is about obedience now number one the first aspect of finishing is surrender say if I'm gonna finish I've got to surrender I've got, to, I've got to walk out this journey to the end of myself. The second aspect of finishing is obedience. Now, obedience is the journey to the surrendering of my will. Oh, God, help me. Obedience is the journey, it's a journey to the surrendering of my will. He wants to will and to do of what? His good pleasure. But what God what God must not find when he comes to perform his will in my life is my will for my life. Tells my God ain't going to resist your will to get his done. God's not going to contend with your will for your life to get his will done. There has to be an alignment of wills. How can two walk together except they be agreed? You understand that? which means that I have to have a mind to do God's will. I got to have a mind that, I've got to have a mind to align with what God has shown me. I've got to have, I have got to have a made up mind. Hello, somebody. That I am here to represent his interests on the planet. And I've got nothing else to do with me but what he wants. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you right now? So watch this now. So obedience is, it says the journey. Obedience is the journey to the surrendering of my will. To a place, watch it now. We're doing what God wants is not what I do in repentance. It's not what I do after the fact. It's, it's the first thing that come to mind. It's the first thing that come to mind. Watch this now, because I did the work to make sure 
that there were no other minds still living in me. All right, thank you. Let this mind be in, which was also, now, some of y'all to understand, you sitting here right now in your right mind, right? But you also got other people's minds living. It's not, yeah, you got your mind, but you still got other people's mind living in there too. And their fears and their philosophies and their unforgiveness and their way of processing things still living in you. It's called a mind. It is a mind. And whoever informs you sets your mind. That's called a mindset. Now, this is why we've been on this journey to study the Bible cover to cover over and over again for the last 20 years. Why? Say it with me. I'm trying to lose my mind completely so there's nothing in me to resist his will. Only thing that stands a chance to the resistance of God's will for your life is your mind if it's not like his and their mind if you have not gotten rid of their minds which lived in you. Now, some of y'all know good and well that you ain't, what you're doing ain't even you. That's your mama's mind. That's your daddy's mind. Hello, somebody. It might even be your mentor's mind. Because you were supposed to learn certain lessons, but you were not supposed to adopt the person's mentality. You understand that? Some of y'all got more than you bargained for in some of these little relationships. Because you got more, you got more than you intended to get in the exchange. And you don't even know it until, until your life requires singularity. But you can't be singular because you're double-minded. I don't know if I should do this or if I should, that's double-mindedness. You're all over the place. You understand that? So the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Say, I got to lose my mind. Take on the mind of Christ and think out of that mind. Now, let me ask you something. Where is feeling? Where is, see, some of y'all put too much stock in feeling stuff. Y'all put too much stock on feelings. And you don't understand that our God is a faith God. Tell somebody God is not interested in your feelings. Now, 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 now listen to me. Your feelings will be fine when they see the result of your faith. Principle. By faith, I've sold generously into the lives of poor people, people that could do nothing for me in return. I didn't have to feel nothing about those transactions. I didn't have to be concerned with what they were going to do with it. Now, I'm over here living in the overflow, and I'm feeling good. Because my feelings are reflecting upon what those sacrifices have done. Oh, but if I would have put my feelings over there... I wouldn't be experiencing this. Stop walking by your feelings. The just shall walk by faith. Y'all understand that? God is not at all concerned about your feelings. That's why God don't care if you do it mad. Y'all didn't read your Bible, did you? God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to. God, God called him to go preach to Nineveh. He didn't want to. God told Jonah to tell Nineveh to repent. He didn't want, he wanted them all to die. He, he obeyed mad. And it was exactly what God wanted because God wasn't moved by his temperamentalism. And yours either. Y'all understand that? Tells my God's interested in your obedience. Y'all realize... God tells my God don't care nothing about your tantrum. God don't care. Y'all didn't read your book, did you? God don't care nothing about your tantrum. You know what God's like? You ready to do what I said? This well will let you out when you ready to do what I said. 
This thing that swallowed you up, I don't care nothing about how mad you are, this thing will swallow you up and it will hold on to you until you're ready to do what I said. And when you're ready to do what I said, mad and all, then this thing will vomit you right into purpose. God ain't like man. God is a spirit. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Y'all understand that? God, God is not like these little friends you make. Y'all fall out. Y'all fall back in. Y'all fall out. God ain't like that. You understand that? He, listen, this is what the Bible said. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. From, watch this now. From the Father of light. See, that means in him there is no darkness at all. Tell somebody, God, never get shady with you. The father of lights has no darkness in him at all. Tell somebody else, God never gets shady with. Even when you get shady with God, God don't get shady with you. He can't because he's light. Now watch this now. So the Bible said every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the father. He's a father. He's a parent. Oh. He, he, he's a parent. He's a parent. And parents are interested in the well-being of their children. You understand that? He's interested in your well-being. You having a tantrum, and he ain't having no. God's not moved because you having a, a hissy fit. In whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. You know what that says about him? God's remaining constant in his nature and character even when you freaking out. So some of y'all haven't done it because you're like, well, I ain't feeling it. God don't need you to feel it. God needs you to do it. I ain't feeling it. You don't need to feel it. You need to obey. Oh, y'all did not hear what I just told you. God does not. Uh, all right, this is going to deliver somebody because somebody been in a holding pattern. God does not need you to feel it. He wants you to do it. Now, when you see what God set up on the other side of your obedience, you're going to feel great. Because then you're going to reap the benefit of doing what God wanted. You're going to feel great after the fact. Y'all understand that? Just do it. Mad and all, do it. Because God ain't moved by mad. All right. That was your lesson on God. Because some of y'all don't understand how how God is. You don't understand his person. This is why some of you have a hard time walking with God because you don't understand his person. God is a whole, he's a spirit. But there's a person behind God. There, there, there are things about God that you got to know about him in your walk with God. Now, finishing is also, write this word down, finishing is also about sanctification. Surrender, obedience, and sanctification. Sanctification is the journey to the consecration of your complete self. Sanctification is the journey. It's, notice it's all a journey. Surrender is a journey. Obedience is a journey. Sanctification is a journey. The, the journey to the consecration of my complete self. What do you mean by that? There is none of me that will be used for anything except God's will. There is none of me that will be used for anything except God's will. That's what consecration looks like. Say it with me. I'm his. Say I was made by God, for God. So consecration is the gathering of all of my faculties and abilities and capacities and surrendering to the usefulness of God and only God. You understand that? Now, there are some of you right now that you're wondering, what has been the hold up on everything God promised me? I know I can see it, but why is it I haven't walked into it? This one simple act of consecration will bring you into a process where God will begin to unfold what he's purposed concerning your life. But as long as others can still use you. Tell somebody, God is not going to do a timeshare with the devil in your life. Hello? Tell somebody, God is not going to do a timeshare with the demonic in your life. Some of y'all walk with God as long as everything's going all right. But the moment it get hard... Then all of a sudden, somebody else get the timeshare. They move right in, and you make the vacancy. 
You understand that? God is fine. You, you're fine with God as long as he's blessing you. But the moment you get lonely, then somebody else, the room fly open. The vacancy comes open in your heart, and then somebody else gets to use you in a way that's not in God's will. Some of you, you're not consecrated enough for what you want God. You're not, what you're praying for, you're not consecrated enough for what you're praying for. You want a spouse, man, if you'll cheat on God, you'll cheat on them. I said if you'll cheat on God, you'll cheat on them. You're not consecrated enough for what, I said if you'll cheat on God, you'll cheat on them. I said, if you'll cheat on God, if you won't, if you won't devote your sexuality to God until you come into a relationship the way God said, if you will cheat on God, you will cheat on who God gave you. What's going to control you in that if God can't control you in this? Look at somebody ask him, are you consecrated enough for what you're praying for? Come on, ask somebody, are you consecrated enough for what you're praying for? You know what consecration is all about? Exclusivity. It's about exclusivity. I gave this example on last week. I asked the question. It was just rhetorical, and it meant to be somewhat comical, but, but there's a little truth in it, right? So every one of us that, that got married, right? Uh, anybody, who, where the married people, right? Now, those of you that are married, but you have a, right, it, keep, put your hand back up. Those of you that are married, but you have an open marriage, keep your hand up. All right. So you don't have an open marriage. So y'all know they got this kind of foolery going on right now, right? Yeah. Open marriages, right? You can sleep who you want, so I sleep with who I want to. Long. We, we, and here's what they're calling themselves. This is the anchor relationship. <laughs> Literally, right? But now... When you married somebody, you expected to be completely devoted to them and them completely devoted to you in all ways. Right or right? That's called consecration. Exclusivity. I, I told 7 billion people no when I told Lisa Jones yes. So I entered into a covenant relationship and one of the terms, my God, of the covenant is exclusivity. Now, how, how can you expect that when you marry somebody, there's going to be exclusivity? But in your relationship with God, there's not. You will flirt with any spirit in your inbox. <laughs> Anything think you cute, you start giving up the goods for it. All right. All right. Matthew, I'm almost done. I'll be done at 1.30. Listen, this is my blessing to y'all. 1.30, all right? Matthew chapter 7. Turn it real quick. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Now, now, here's some things to consider along the way. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. Watch the directive of Scripture and pattern your life after this directive. Watch what he said. What, remember, what is there in the principle? Protection. Say it with me. There's protection in the principle. Everything God commanded you is to keep you from something your soul will be devastated by. You keep running to God with your damage when you should have run to God for instructions to prevent damage. Because there's protection where? Tell somebody, just follow the principle. The principle is not there to make your life hard. The principle is there to protect you from another kind of life. The life that kills, steal, and destroy. The principle keeps you from the predator. 
the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The principle keeps you from the predator. I am come that you might have life and have it how? More abundantly. Where is abundant life? In the principle. Y'all understand that? Now, you know why I got to go here? I don't see living for God and doing what the word says as a chore or a religion. I see it as a loving act of obedience to someone trying to protect me and bring me into promises. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Well, what y'all Christians get to do? What y'all don't know? Y'all don't have no fun. Your fun keep bringing you into bondage. Your fun, your fun depress you. Your your fun, you need pills after your fun. And some of it, you need penicillin after your fun. <laughs> what can y'all Christians do? The stuff that don't destroy us. The stuff that God calls life and life more abundantly. There's protection in the principle. There's protection in the principle. Y'all understand that? God said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. And then you listen to these knuckleheads. That church that wants your money. Now God is telling you there's protection in the principle. He said, if you give, he said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You'll not have room enough to receive. Watch what he said. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. He said, I will add elasticity to your money. He said, $20 will go longer with you than it goes with anybody else. And you letting somebody that's outside of the principle keep you from it. There's security in the principle. There's, secure, there's security in the principle. You understand that? 28 years. I've never spent the tithe on anything since 1993 but the tithe. So while all these people, oh, that's under the law, and I don't know why you giving the church your money, I'm like, listen, I don't care what y'all do. I ain't, I ain't finna talk. Watch this now. I ain't finna try to talk you into this. Watch my life and see what the principle produces. And when the enemy came in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord set up a standard. When the devourer came, he couldn't touch my life. When the famine came, he couldn't touch my life because the principle protected me from the pandemic. The principle protected me from the... Yo, watch what I just said. Y'all better watch what I just said to you. The principle kept me from the famine. There's protection where? There's protection in the principle. You understand that? I'll never be broke another day in my life. You understand this? I got so many loans with God right now, he had to spend the rest of his life paying them back to me. You realize how many poor people I've helped? Watch what the Bible said. When you give to the poor, what are you doing? Somebody said, I got loans racked up with God because my wallows are, because it's a part of my lifestyle to give to those that can do nothing for me in return. There's protection in the principle. You know what God said? Because you've helped people that cannot do anything for you in return, I'm going to make sure you never end up in a soup line. I'm going to make sure you don't qualify for a stimulus check. I'm <laughs> I said, I'm going to make sure you don't qualify for a stimulus check. Y'all better watch. <laughs> There's protection in the principle. There's protection in the principle. Y'all understand that? And I'm telling you, I've been, I've been called, you crazy, you naive. You, I've been called some of everything doing what God said. But now watch this now. Ain't nobody who criticized me doing better than me. Oh, 
Oh, man. Our God is faithful. Whew. I said, our God. <laughs> hey, I said, our God is faithful. I said, his word never returns unto him void. His word will accomplish in your life exactly what he said. I said, our God is faithful. All right. Matthew 7, 13 says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and there are many that enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. Watch this, and only few find it. Come here, war rails. Come here for a minute. I need both of y'all. Let me show you something. Stand right here. Right? Stand right here. Just like that. I need you to turn your back to him. Right there. Now watch this now. Now let me show y'all something. If I'm out here, I'm, I'm, all, I'm just doing me. I'm living my life, right? When I, come, when I come to the principle, this is the principle. We just read the principle, right? The principle told me narrow is the way. That leads to what? To life. To life. To life. Anybody want life? Do you want to just exist or do you want to thrive? Do you want life? You just want a mundane existence, or do you want to live? I'm talking about life to the full, to the low, whoo, overflows, no, I'm, I'm talking about life, that, that life you're so glad to be you that you can't wait to get up. I'm talking about life, life. Now, watch this now. No matter what happened, right, when you come upon this principle, back up just a little bit, Shannon, just right there, right, up a little bit, right? All right, now, when you come upon this principle right here, no matter what you've been doing, in order to enter into what this principle produces, you got to adjust yourself. Y'all see how narrow this is? Y'all see how narrow this is? Your life has to conform to the principle in order to experience the results that the principle has. Y'all did not hear what I said. In order to experience the abundance on the other side of the principle, you have to come in through the very narrow way. That means that you don't have the liberties other people have. That means that you don't have the fun other people have. That means that you don't have, you got some rules about your life that other people don't see. In the church, you got rules about your life that other people in the church don't even seem to know about. Tell somebody, but I'm entering into something. It may, it, may, it may seem restrictive at the doorway, but it's wide. When you, when you step into, when you step, when you step into the, the when you step into what this purpose to bring you into, then you understand why God had rules for you that other people didn't seem to hear. Why you why you had to love people that hated you. Why, you had to sanctify your lifestyle when you got all this free sex going on out here these days in these streets. Why, you, you had to keep giving, and other people were criticizing you for what you're giving, but you're like, somebody shout, I'm entering into something. I can't be just any kind of way entering into this. Because narrow... <laughs> Narrow is the way. Now, now let me show you something, right? All right, y'all, stay right there. Don't, don't go anywhere. All right, I need some travelers to try to get through here with me. Come on, now watch this now. Uh, come on. All right, come on, Isaiah. Do it. Do you. Elder Catherine, I need you doing you. Come on, Monique, I need you doing you. Just do, just do you. Wilding out. Do you. Do you. Come on. Do you. Just try to watch. Now watch. No, you doing you. Keep wilding out. Keep doing you. Just try to do your thing. Now, see. Now, this way, this, this way, come on. Y'all try to get, get through there, try to get through there. Come on. Y'all see that? They, they ain't finna get, they ain't finna get, they ain't finna get through, through that, into that, with all this going on. Now, now, now watch this. Now, stay right there. Now, you stay right here. All right, now y'all keep on wilding out. Come on through, wilding out. Doing you. Turn down for what? Come on, turn down for what? Y'all, come on, do a turn down for what? Now, now, destruction, oh, it's over here. But you see how easy it was to get into destruction? Because in order to enter into destruction, you don't have to conform to anything. In order to enter into destruction, all you got to do is wake up and do you. 
But if you're going to enter into that which the narrow way has promised, you have got to become very intentional about how you're living your life. You have got to become very refined, very restrictive, very guarded about your life. And notice, notice, notice that you can't take anyone through this way with you. This, this way doesn't make room for couples. This way don't make room for couples. Somebody shout this between me and God. This, somebody shout, this way is between me and God. This way is, man, now we may, we may both be able to go, but we ain't both going at the same time. You got to come through the same way. I, I, hello, somebody. The, the couples can't come through together. Every person got to come through on their own. Every person has to be intentional about conformity and alignment and bringing their life into it. There's an order in, there's an order in this way. Thank y'all. There's an order. There's an order in this way. You understand that, believers? There's an order in this way. There's an order in this way. And in order to experience the benefits that has been promised by this way, you have got to align with this way. You've got to bring your life into conformity to this way. You have got to buy into this way. Y'all understand that? All right. Give me three more minutes and I'm done. So along the way, write this down. Learn how to treasure simplicity. If you're going to build a life that glorifies God, you've got to learn how to treasure simplicity. Now, this means that I know there are some of you right now that love adventure. <laughs> and make sure that whatever adventure you're going after don't bring you into bondage. Life is much easier when it's devoid of complexity. Jesus said, I am the way. How simple is that? Write this down. Fear God, love people, and be faithful unto death. Fear God, love people, and be faithful unto death. Pretty simple, isn't it? Live by it. Live by that. Live by it. Don't ever give yourself permission to hate anyone. Don't ever give yourself permission for offense, unforgiveness, bitterness. Don't ever get into that posture. It leads to death. Every time you walk in unforgiveness, something dies. Here's the next thing. Make sure you're not bemoaning what the world has to offer. You got to embrace this thing as if the world has nothing for you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26 through 24 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, notice maturity is a factor. Refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, my God. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Y'all realize that's what Moses had in store for him, the treasures of Egypt, right? For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You understand that? Moses turned his back on the world of his day. He could have very easily become the Pharaoh. He could have very easily become Listen, the son of Pharaoh's daughter would have become the Pharaoh. He gave it all up. For what? To go lead a stubborn people. He gave all of that up to go help a people that hated his help. He gave up all of that to go help a people that fought him all the way through his process of delivering them. Now, why am I telling you that? 
Because when you're helping people, you got to know why you're doing it. Say it with me. Helping people is between me and God. Ain't got nothing to do with how these people act. Helping people is between men where they don't appreciate me, where they don't value me, where they don't honor me, where they don't. This is between me and God. This is between me and God. You understand that? That's the lesson of the text. He gave up all of that. Remember, remember, one of the things we cautioned against was distortion, right? So Moses left the grandeur of Egypt, the promises of rulership, the riches of Egypt. He left that, came into his assignment, and still didn't go into the promised land. Why? Distortion. Tell somebody, you're letting people get to you. Listen, and, and anything you let get to you has a potential of keeping you out of something you were supposed to get to. Anything you, let, anything you let people get to you has a propensity to keep you from something you're supposed to get to. What's the principle of the text? Tell somebody, don't let people get under your skin. Don't let people get under your skin. Now, I have been called insensitive. I have been called callous. I have been called nonchalant. And I'm grateful for all of those compliments. Because you know what people were really mad about, Pilar? You tried everything that killed your last pastor, and it didn't get to me. <laughs> you try, everything made your last pastor depressed, you tried on me. And it don't work, because I'm, I'm dead. To, if I'm dead to me, you know I'm dead to you. And dead men don't feel nothing. Y'all understand that? I'm a dead man. Dead men don't feel nothing. You understand that? I lead by faith. I don't lead people based on how I feel about them. Did you hear what I said? I lead by faith. I don't lead people based on how I feel about them. I don't feel nothing. I love you, but that ain't a feeling. That's a choice to make sure that my behavior benefits you. Y'all hear what I said? Love is not a feeling. Hello? Love, your feelings are the result of the choice to love. But love is not a feeling. Love is a choice to make sure that what you do benefits others. My being will be to your benefit. That's what love is. You understand that, believers? But, but nothing, listen, nothing people do moves me. Nothing. I am dead to people, alive to God. It's all about the assignment. It's all about the assignment. You understand that? All right. You know, last week I had somebody before I went on vacation. They walked up to the altar and apologized to me. I'm so sorry for how I treated you. Now, here's the kicker. I don't even remember what they did. I'm sitting here going, what did you do? I'm serious. I'm standing here. I don't know what you did. I don't even. I, you know what I get? I guarantee you, whatever you did, I forgave you as soon as you did it. So it didn't live in me till you got back. As God is my witness. I don't know. I don't know what they did for which they needed to apologize. Sound like, all right, then, welcome back. <laughs> Living for God can be awkward because the demonic world seems cooler. Living for God can be awkward because the demonic world sometimes seems much cooler than living for God. Y'all understand that? Now, tell somebody you can get with cool or you can get with hot. <laughs> what if you created a sanctified cool? What if you create a sanctified cool? Y'all know you can be cool and saved, right? If you can't, I'm going to hell. The, you know what was really crazy, man? I one time, I one time, because y'all know how I'm into fitness and making sure that I deal with the body of Christ about the bodies of Christ. I one time had an extremely obese fella get in my inbox telling me that it was a doggone shame that I was putting my pictures of me working out on the internet. 
And I'm like, dear brother. I am certain that your obesity misrepresents God's will more than my discipline. I got unfriended. <laughs> Hello? He's honest. I'm like, you coming at me because I'm, I'm illustrating whole life prosperity and trying to help people save their life through disciplined living? And meanwhile, you're preaching your religion at me over that gut? You tried the wrong one. You completely tried the wrong one. You completely tried the wrong one. He got upset. He'll, he'll be all right. Now watch this now. So the world, now write this down. The world is my assignment, not my friend. The world is my assignment not my friend. Y'all understand that? That's why the Bible said make no friendships of the world. God said don't come, don't become tied to that system. Don't become tied to that system and those mentalities because they will take you away from what God has purposed concerning your life. And lastly, lastly, the resolve that you need to live singularly is only found in the presence of God. The resolve that you need to live singularly. What do you mean by that? God don't want you living a double-minded life. Wherever you got double mind, you got two lives too. God does not want you living in confusion. God does not want you living in duplicity. God does not want you living in perversion. But the resolve, how many know to really live singularly? For me to live is what? is Christ. That's singular, plural. That's singular, right? In order to live singularly, the resolve you need to live singularly is only found in him. See, as I look around me, and I'm not talking about the world only, I'm talking about the church too. As I look around me, and I think about what God requires of me in my life and in my lifestyle, right? If I were to judge what I should do based on what people in the church are doing, I would not be living singularly for God because I see a lot of double-minded Christians. How you know they have double minds? They got two lives too. So what I discovered is that for me to really live this thing, Sister Brenda, for me to really live this, I had to become resolved in Christ that this is my life. It's not my religion. Say this with me. This is not my religion. This is my life. It's not even a sacrifice. This is my life. You understand that? Holiness is not a chore. I've been brought into an exclusive... <laughs> I've been brought into an exclusive relationship with the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The matchless one. So holiness is not a chore. This is my life. Anything other than holiness is not my life. But it comes from the wicked one as a way that leads to destruction. Father, we thank you that you have ordained this series, Building a Life That Glorifies God. We thank you that you have given us the information. Thank you for joining us today. Visit us for one of two services on Sunday mornings, 8 o'clock and 1030 a.m. There are so many ways to partner with us. If God is using this ministry to impact your life and you would like to reach others by sowing a seed, text the word GIVE to 754-210-8654. Visit www.centerformanifestation.com to stay connected with us. Also, visit us on YouTube at Manifestations Worldwide. This is the season for the manifestation of the sons of God. Be blessed and manifest.